they kind of hinge everything around the word sapper, right? A sapper is a person who paves the way for others. They're a person who blazes the trail. You get the mission prepared, you get your equipment prepared, and your soldiers prepared in a short amount of time, and you get the mission accomplished. You never quit. Sapper is the finest engineer that America's Army has to produce. Uh, they essentially are the best of the best. A sapper is actually a state of mind. The spirit of this organization falls on the, the general sapper and the typical sapper who goes out there every single day and clears the roadways for our task force. Oh, sappers are the best, man. I mean, we blow up and, and we keep driving on. Oh, Dark 30, traditional time for some of the tougher aspects of military training. Take a Zodiac F-470, which lists at 322 pounds, toss in 10 rucksacks at 35 pounds apiece, a couple of 10-gallon water containers, and you've got Boat PT. Welcome to the Waterborne Operations segment of the Sapper Leaders Course at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. Off your head. Get up. Start with a few exercises with the boat, then set off on a mile and a half race carrying the boat. Of course, if you get tired, you can rest. It's not One. Maybe even frolic in the water as dawn begins to break. Four. At the end, you carry your instructors triumphantly across the finish line. Or not so triumphantly. Somebody may want to relieve that guy in the back. Obviously, he's close to <laughs> Finish it all off with some cool down exercises. Stop making those disgusting sounds. <laughs> to get you ready for another race, this one on the water. All for one, Sam. Push him off. Get him out of there. Let's go, Hughes. Get it together. Before coming ashore, there's one more test a capsize drill. Students have to flip their boats, then right them. All of this is for a deadly serious purpose, to harden and prepare leaders to take a wide range of skills to the battlefield. By the way, the boat that finished first on land came in last in the water. The Sapper Leader course is open to E-4s and above and junior officers. It also accepts West Point cadets after their third year, and now ROTC cadets as well. It's open to men and women. While most students are engineers, the course is open to all soldiers. Classes start with about 50 students. Only about 40% will graduate. They're bombarded with a wide range of information and field experience in 28 days. It's like a shotgun of knowledge, like one of the sergeants said. And just every single day you wake up and you get, learn like 30 new things and uh, you're just trying to retain all the information. It's awesome. And you got to be able to pick it up and get all that, you know, all that information and use it. Let's get down to the meat and potatoes of this. Helo casting operations, who can tell me what helo casting operations are used for? Quick insertion. Quick insertion, right? Some of them have never been exposed to uh, small unit tactics and then have to perform small unit tactics in a highly stressful environment. Helo casting is typically done over the horizon. Who can tell me what over the horizon means? Compound that by the, the opportunity to learn some specialized engineer skills which are not taught anywhere else in the Army. The outcome is an asset to the task force commander. That's our customer. That's who we're wanting to please. None of the students wear rank insignia. We've had up to a lieutenant colonel come to the course, and every, every student, regardless if they're a junior enlisted or they're a field grade officer, they're treated the same exact way. And afterwards, we've never had any animosity towards us from the way the cyber schools ran. They see that the instructors here at the cyber leader course are extremely professional. Let's go, Sapper! Pick it up! 
One exercise the students seem to relish is helo casting, jumping into the lake of the Ozarks from a low flying helicopter. Some of you didn't pay attention to detail. You had pretty s exits. Some of you could have possibly got seriously s up out there. If you get s up on a mission, on an insertion, how are you going to accomplish your mission? You're not. They make two jumps, one just in uniform, the second with a combat rucksack. The rucksack adds an element the school doles out in subtle and not so subtle ways, stress. Let's go, Sapper, run! It adds a little bit more stress to them because they must throw the rucksack out at a certain angle uh, prior to stepping off the tailgate to avoid, uh, to avoid injury falling on top of the rucksack itself. Quit stalling, we're waiting on you, delay of training. The swim itself, it's, uh, it's a good swim. It's, it's approximately a 100 meter swim uh, directly after the Hilo cast, and uh, especially with combat equipment. And get the position attention like the rest of the patrol. What if a unit had to cross a body of water and had no boat? All right, once he's routed from bottom to top through both center garments, he's going to create a half hitch going around the standing end of the rope. During this exercise, students partner up and learn how to improvise a flotation device using their ponchos. And then throw it over, and then through that loop, and then center down. If you do it that way every time, you can't mess it up. Every time you do your half hitches, right? And they're graded on their execution. Ten minutes, Cyber. Go! For a sapper, knowledge of knots is essential. It's essential in securing the improvised raft here and will be later in mountaineering operations and in using explosives. Knots is also a way to implement discipline in them because we give them a whole bunch of knots, we tell them to tie them a certain way, and it's stressed upon them that they tie those knots in a certain way. Not only do they have to know how to tie the knots, but they need to know the checkpoints of the knots, what makes the knot the knot, and, and the purpose of the knot. Pretty much every activity is punctuated with extended bursts of PT, in this case to warm everyone up for a cross-channel swim with their improvised rucksack floats. How many passed the poncho test? About 40% on everything. And then 40% uh, of the class graduates at the end, so it just kind of works out. Pass or fail? No go. The rock is past the midpoint of the raft. That is just going to be a heck of a swim for you. It's into the swim for everyone. The swim is grueling for most, about 300 meters each way across the cove. The cadre circles in boats, creating wakes that generate an extra degree of difficulty for the swimmers. Once ashore, they have to report into the graders table. Savers, get it above your head, hurry up! Good camaraderie, good guys and get to swim in the lake. It's like a uh, beach day. For a select few, like Second Lieutenant Joseph Lunn, who's a military diver, the swim was a relative breeze. Nah, this was a walking park. For others, not so easy. What are you doing? What did I say to put it down? Pick it back up, move to the water. Saber Thompson, Sergeant. I'm not ready for you, Saber. You hold what you got. Saber is back to the water. <laughs> I was gasping pretty good, I think. We dropped our rucks a couple times. Yeah. Get moving over. But we um, got confused. Where to go? <laughs> get it up! Don't try. Because we went to the table and then he told us to leave, but we thought he meant back to the water. So we went back to the water and then back to the table he meant over here. So yeah. That eventually came to the right spot, so it worked out well. Once you get over there, derig and drink water. Students were given a choice of small boulders from which to select their class rock. Specialist Cesar Sanchez came up with the winner. As a sapper, you look for the heavy stuff. You're not a weak person. A sapper, an engineer, you look for the tough stuff. So everybody start looking for the small rock and stuff. So I look for the heavy one because we we sappers and sapper carry the heavy stuff, right? It's just the way it goes. Sappers lead the way. Milling about just simply to look busy. What's going on at this point? Since 2004. Graduates of the Sapper Leader School have been authorized to wear a Sapper uniform tab on their left shoulder, like the Ranger and Special Forces tabs. In the engineer world, <laughs> it shows quite a bit. It's yeah. equivalent to a Ranger tab in the infantry. It's something that separates you, showing they don't exceed the training standards. 
The tab is so prized, soldiers are willing to go through the demanding 28-day course more than once to earn it. My job is a sapper, and I mean, I'm a team leader back at uh, Fort Rich, so I mean, wouldn't look good for me to go back w without it. As an engineer, this is, this is, my, this is it. This is all, all I ever wanted to do. And now I'm here, and uh, I didn't make it the first time. That's why I couldn't go back to my company without a tab. One, two, three. The term sapper is an old one. It goes back to the 14 and 1500s. Dr. Larry Roberts is chief historian for the engineer school. The sapper is a actually a siege warfare term. It goes back to the days of the invading army laying siege to the castle or the fortress or whatnot. In the process of doing that, you would dig approach trenches to get up next to the wall. Uh, those approach trenches were called saps, and the people who dug them were called sappers. The Engineer Museum at Fort Leonard Wood houses dioramas and displays depicting the history of American military engineers. At the Battle of Yorktown, where the British surrender clinched America's independence, a company of miners and sappers worked on field fortifications and joined the key assault as infantrymen. The American Civil War engineers built roads, bridges, and fortifications, and played a famous role in the siege of Petersburg, Virginia. They tunneled under Confederate lines, dug out a chamber, and filled it with gunpowder. The ensuing explosion created a huge crater. And ultimately, a good section of the Confederate line disappeared. World War I saw an evolution of the role of all combat engineers the sapper became a key figure. The person we see as that individual going forward to breach the wire, to create the gap so the, the infantry can move forward. Uh, that person was really born in the battlefields of World War I uh, because of the elaborate trench systems and, and things like that. On World War II's pivotal D-Day, combat engineers were among the first to land. Because it was their chore to blow gaps in the beach obstacles that would allow the landing craft uh, to come in and, and discharge the infantry troops. Uh, so they had a monumental role, and they took monumental casualties. In World War II, the combat engineer also encountered a new responsibility, the landmine. That becomes a huge, huge role in World War II. Um, and that role will carry forward into Korea and to an extent even Vietnam. And in Vietnam, there was a new threat to contend with. Tunnel systems where guerrillas could hide and store weapons. The term sapper came back into use in the Corps of Engineers after Vietnam. I think the reason why it, it reemerged is we had a lot of senior leaders in the regiment who had time in Vietnam. The most dangerous person on the battlefield in Vietnam was the NVA or VC sapper. Uh, he could come through the wire without you knowing it. Uh, he could blow up your hooch or your bunker without you knowing it. Knowledge and use of explosives have long been central to the sapper's mission. That remains true today. Claymore. Let me see the components. Claymore. But at the Sapper Leader course, right. students are being taught a broader skill set than Six, ever seven, before. Eight, nine, right. You know, when we're talking about airborne operations, waterborne operations, mountaineering operations, pathfinder operations, uh, and just the, the culmination and, and the marriage of each one of those skills in one person. And so we're talking a very diversified individual uh, that's, you know, honed. Yeah, to uh, you know, a sharp point and ready to go out there to the cutting edge of battle. Got like five minutes to square the dog on patrol away. We'll blow you out of here and we'll start it off again. Roger, yes, you on the clock. Day three of the Sapper Leader Course's field training exercise, a long-range patrol through a rugged stretch of the Ozark Mountains. It's a grueling four-day ordeal with little food or sleep. It's also the student final exam, and it must be passed if they're to earn a sapper tab. I'm going to tell y'all what, it's on you. You're writing your own grade today. You might want to be squared away today, all of you. 
we have to enforce the standards as, as NCOs here, and that's uh, that's exactly what we're going to do. Now, there's different ways that you can do it. I just uh, have my ways of doing it. Some people are softer and gentler. I'm kind of not that way. Hey, Patuna song. Oh, say, what? say pop. Right. Uh -huh. hey, that's your head popping out your ass right now. You need to swear this shit away, like uh -huh. right now. Platoon and squad leadership positions are rotated through the 46 students in this class. It's the student's job to execute a series of missions. Operations plans must be prepared and issued. Okay, enemy situation. The Darien and Rebel forces are positioning supplies and equipment for planned attacks on U.S. forces. And I've started going towards the uh, vantage points which I chose. It's the instructor's job, called a walker during the patrol, to stand back, observe, evaluate, and keep the pressure on. And I wouldn't probably sit on my ass. I'd probably get up here and checking on security. They're exposed to uh, obstacles and all types of different tasks here that build that confidence in leadership. They find out about themselves. They find out about, you know, each other. They find out, hey, if I'm hungry and tired and I've had sleep in two days, I can still move out and execute that mission. The scenario is a movement through hostile territory. At each stopping point, a security perimeter must be set up. And back up out of that poison ivy. Students back are expected to put information that was shotgunned at them early in the course to practical use. All right, let's go. The general subjects phase was tough, especially if you didn't know anything about demo or knots. Patrolling phase can be very difficult, and sleep deprivation. I tell you, I'm tired right now. Zero sleep, zero, so... Some of the stuff that we learned here, we learned during the GS phase earlier, you know, you know, two and three weeks ago, that we touched on once, now we got to implement it a couple weeks later when you're sleep deprived and you know, a little on the hungry side. Today's mission, get into position for an attack tomorrow. The platoon will have to overcome a series of challenging natural obstacles first. What is the security plan right now? The PL is not here. So who's in charge of this patrol right now? What we have to do so to get the these students plan? to rise up to their peak leadership ability is to induce this extraordinary amount of stress as close to battle as we can possibly make it. You know, we overwhelm them with various forms of stress. Be it simulated artillery, long movements, difficult oh missions, God, or just again. those very what leading questions. Right Why are all these people continuing to come down this hill it's stacking there like firewood. It puts you in a lot of stress, stressful environments. You know, they're hollering at you when you're leading and whatnot. So it teaches people to make decisions. Get hot. They don't let you dither around too much. You dither around, you pretty much get no dood pretty quickly. Right. What are we doing? What are you doing? I'm going to just. <clears throat> I like to ask open ended questions and questions that uh, the student usually doesn't have an immediate answer for or will, you know, in fact, create some level of confusion and an induced form of stress. The first of the natural obstacles, a 90-foot cliff at the bottom of a steep incline. Knots are again very important. For some, repelling is a breeze. For others, definitely stressful. Get your hand out of that rescue weight and just repel. The rucksacks are so heavy. That's a technique, I guess. That any repeller who tips winds up making the trip upside down with no chance of righting themselves. Sorry, but that was so ugly. I'm thinking about making you go again. That was terrible, Sergeant. I know it was. I'm seriously considering. Get over there. At the bottom. You're dead. Get out, Gearling. Get out. You you don't want to get down behind cover Kissimmee. You're dead. The platoon suffers casualties and has to cross a stream under attack. Fortunately, the water is down and they don't have to throw up a temporary bridge. On this patrol, what comes down must go back up. On the other side of the stream, a 90-foot vertical ascent. The mission called for the entire platoon to be on top of the cliff by 2030. Cadet Caleb Edwards was acting as assistant platoon leader. He asked me what time I thought I could do it in. I said, oh, we'll probably get it done by 1930. I think uh, that would be impressive. He asked me if I'd be willing to bet my chow on that. So I was like, yeah, I'll bet my chow. I didn't know I was betting the whole platoon's chow. I played his words against him a little bit, and I said, so you're, you're willing to bet your patrols chow, all of it, for the day. All righty. We've got the ball rolling. 
You know, I put them in that dilemma. You know, what would you do in that particular situation? Are you willing to risk everything that your men, you know, have on the line? Food. And are you willing to put your, you know, a little bit of yourself forward? It made us work a whole lot harder. We didn't make the hit time, but everyone took it pretty good. They weren't too mad at me. We didn't make that hit time, but we're going to make a hard time. So mission's still going to be success, minus chow. The medics were just informing us on uh, or recommending types of things to eat because we were talking about eating berries. Uh, so they, said they, they recommend eating insects higher in protein and less likely to get poisoned. Hey, you, you tied it, you ride it. Oh. We ate at 5 o'clock in the morning two days ago, and then we ate this morning around 6. So it was a good, good meal this morning. The grueling pace of the patrol wears on even the best conditioned soldiers. It'll be the heavy rucksacks. Oh, wow. Yeah. Heavy rucksacks. Takes a toll on your body. Yeah. Weighed down with about with 60 to 80 pounds at a time. Give or take, any day, yeah. This has definitely pushed me to my limits. I'm like, dang, they weren't kidding, you know, and they said the rucks were heavy and, you know, days were long. By this point, some are drifting off even in daylight. The nights have been an even bigger challenge. Take the sapper who struggled with sentry duty on night three. He's just, you know, he's bobbing back and forth, and I guess he finally went to sleep and <laughs> hit the ground. And, I, and you could hear it all over. People just hitting the ground. Your stuff is supposed to be inside your Alice pack. What's going on at this point? Walkers rotate every 24 hours during the patrol. They end with a critique of students' leadership performance during their shift. What were you doing? Sleeping. Sleeping. And you as a leader should have known I need to get up and take a knee. I hate when they don't do good, you know. He may not have gotten a go on his patrol, but he may have learned something, you know, valuable lesson, something he can still take back to his unit with him. Stay motivated, Sapper. All right, sir. You know, that's, I guess, what I'm having trouble with, too. I can always find something wrong, but I think, you know, it really takes something to find something right about an individual and help them see what's right in them and then help that individual improve, helping them become better leaders. It's not always about pass or fail, it's what you walk away from the course with. The patrol concludes with an attack on an enemy bunker. A Bangalore torpedo will be used to breach the concertina wire defending the bunker. Captain Joshua Eggers, platoon leader for the morning, told us that this part of the patrol was more tightly scripted than anything else in the four days. It's to show you what right is. We're going to push you out there and let you try to accomplish the missions and critique what you've done, and then we're going to try to culminate that in an exercise that turns out pretty much correctly. The wire is breached. The bunker overrun. Casualties are taken. What do I got for EPW search team? Sabre, that's a hey, better support your chain of command. Yes, sir. You guys pulling security? Uh, is for an exit wound? Is it, is it just entry wound? Nye has a blown off leg. Blown off leg. For those who didn't pass some of the earlier tests, there will be makeup tests the next day. For select others, the 28-day Sapper Leader course is over. Only 21 of the 46 class members have earned a Sapper tab. No matter what anybody tells you to kind of prepare you, it's, it's more than what they said. It's very physically and mentally challenging and uh, very rewarding. I, I enjoyed it a lot. You know, I'm in the course thinking, I'm just going to smoke this thing. It's going to be easy for me, you know, because I'm bad at the bone. But uh, it was a gut check, and uh, it was humbling. One of the best things I think I learned about myself is that your body will do more than your mind thinks it can. Uh, you'll, you'll get to a point where you, you, you think you can't go, but all of a sudden you just keep on trucking. Okay, just fall back. Um, I learned a lot about leadership, about being a leader by myself. I learned a lot about myself. Zappers hole.